I, this is this is a really interesting distinction between English round hand and and my form of copper plate. This gives us more of a. And picking up where I left off last week, so um, let's see, we ended with the N. Let's add two and then one, two, three lines. Uh, right, so I, I, again, I'm going to start with the pencil because it really does help to inform the structure of the letters. So this is the O. And notice I'm I'm on the flat of the pencil. I'm not on a point. No pressure, pressure, pressure. And one and two and three and four. So I, I count because the counting helps to slow down the writing. Um, I actually have this on my sheet at two. And I have it um, a little bit more pointed at the base. There we go. The other O that I have on the page is this. And you know, these look surprisingly like minuscule O's, which a lot of people tend to do this to. I, I, I don't do this. I, I do this and I join in the middle third. So my ligature joins the next letter in, in a correct place rather than pushing it across in an odd sort of place. And um, as I'm just running through the minuscule, <clears throat> sorry, the majuscules that I've, I've found in these manuscripts, in these writing master copybooks, I'm just putting them as I have them. So you may see, well, you will see letters, which you've seen before, but there are very, very slight variations. So this wasn't meant to be a ligature. It's just meant to, to sort of fill some space. Now, I, in my copper plate script, I use um, my angular confinement system to hold everything in place. And everything tends to sit on the 55. So all these three strokes are on the 55. Whereas with this historical O, you have the 55 and you have another angle. So again, remember we looked at this B and how the historical, my B sits within a parallelogram and the historical B actually uses a series of other basic shapes like triangles. And we can see that happening here again. Now, the other thing about this O is some of the O's start here, some start here. So it's, so looking at the starting point is really key. And um, in these variations, one O starts, that's the, the, the apex there, starts below the apex and comes up and back and around. And the other O starts just over the apex to give us a little, little loop. A variation on this is, notice where the 
I call this a dollop finial. <clears throat> So this dollop finial points up and this one points across. They can also point, I mean, they can point in any number of directions. This one points this way. One of the other interesting features with these kinds of peas, and again, I go back to my angular confinement. With my angular confinement, I stay within the parallelogram and my um my base shape is is an ellipse so i, I don't call these ovals because you think of an oval you have a tendency to think of an egg which is pointed at the top and uh, bigger at the bottom so i call these oblate ellipses because they tend to be flatter on the sides than at the top historically there is more of a circular shape um, embedded in this kind of elliptical construct. Um, and even here, you can see that you know, that's, that's, that's really more circular than, than elliptical. And I guess that's why people tend to refer to them as ovals because of the historical context. Now, one of the other things that I noticed was um, some of the peas have a tendency to to be higher, and they point down as opposed to having a a, a dollop finial. And with this shape, so there, there are lots of variations of this shape, which can be misconstrued as either a T or an I or possibly a J. So it really does uh, depend on context. This lead-in stroke varies so much. So in, in, in my version of this, if I'm doing an I, I go up and over and down and back and under. This tends to be on the 55. These tend to lean a little bit more. Um, but this top lead-in stroke has a tendency to vary from this angle to horizontal angle to an upward angle. So it, 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 it gives you so much more scope for, for, for play. And some of the finials, some of the terminal finials, the, the, the terminal and um, dollop shapes tend to go out and up and back on themselves. So they, they fill in because of how the ink pulls back onto itself. Um, but the, the location of this, so this is pointing upward at an angle and this is not pointing straight across, it's actually if you look at the direction, it's aiming for a spiral. So notice I've turned the pen. And these, these V's are really quite fascinating because they are not on the 55. So I find this really quite odd and a lot of them vary from this angle through to a much more vertical angle. So I'm not going to do the, the lead-in um, horizontal wave stroke. And so this is the 55. This is a, a completely different angle. I mean, this is this is almost, I would say that's about 
80 degrees um, possibly 75 and this comes down and up and out so this doesn't necessarily connect with another letter it's just a, a an additional bit of decoration I go up, down, back. And this is something I found really fascinating with the X's in this, in, in, in this study that I'm doing. Um, I, I make an X like this. And I put weight on the second stroke. simply because too much ink there causes, uh, it causes the paper to destabilize. But they do this amazing sort of weight in the middle and they come back and they put weight at the top and release the weight from there. And it, it gives the X a very different, different shape. So you really have to sort of control it. So there's one of these Zs again. Now, again, this with this Z, the image that I have on my on my sheet is actually um, so I'm, I'm I'm setting up the Z because I, I have to sort of rotate back through it. So I, I, I've rotated enough so that I have the space to rotate back through it. So you see that rotation from, so look at where the nib is facing. And I come around and as I get to the bottom, I turn and turn and turn. So I have the ability to press because of course, if you're facing this direction, you can't press in the direction of the 55. You have the tines must face, the underside of the tines must face the direction of the 55. Come back around, roll back at you. So you go, um, one, two, three, four, press, two, three, four, roll, two, three, four, little press, two, three, four, roll, two, three, four, roll, two, three, four, press, two, three, four, up, two, three, four. So there's, 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 there's quite a lot of tool manipulation going on here. Ah, and there's another O. This is great. This is a lovely O. Um, down and up and over and back and out. That's rather messy. Let me just fix that. And there's this really lovely M. Oh, this is so beautiful. Too big, too wide. So again, here you'd really need to be careful with these internal spaces. So let's 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 look at trying to do that one more time. So I'm sort of setting up the space for myself here. Keep it narrow, keep it narrow, and keep it narrow. Um, I, 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 personally, I personally feel that it, it looks better with a pencil than with, this, uh, with the nib. And you, you really see that difference. So training with a pencil really does help. So I hope that's given you a little bit more insight into some of the historical um, English roundhand letter forms that I'm A lot of people, when they do the letter P, they do this and they wiggle. So 
this is on the 55 and this is at 